Welcome to The Hill's Coronavirus Report. I'm Steve Clemens, Editor-at-Large of The Hill. Each day we are interviewing consequential leaders and innovators in the battle against the coronavirus. Here in the U.S., the CDC is tracking a dozen different models for deaths due to COVID-19. All of the models forecast an increase of the mortality rate in the coming weeks, with a cumulative total that will likely be more than 100,000 people by June 1st. But in the past month, the number of deaths has almost doubled. And the director of the CDC warns that a second wave of the virus could be even more complicated if it coincides with the flu season. He has pushed for accelerated investment in the nation's public health infrastructure because of the heavy impact COVID and the flu could have on the country. The director has himself been quarantined after exposure to COVID-19 in the White House. Even if his is considered low risk exposure, it speaks to the fact that literally everyone is vulnerable to contracting the virus. Dr. Redfield joins me now via Skype. He is a virologist and is director of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Welcome. Dr. Redfield, thank you so much for joining us today. You have warned that in the fall, we may have a return of COVID-19 that co- uh, moves right along with the flu, and you have serious worries about that and our public health infrastructure. What are we missing in our public health infrastructure that you think we need to put in place? Steve, I think it's really one of the important I think awakenings for a broad aspect of our society is that the public health infrastructure of this nation has been underinvested in for decades. And so when you really look at it now, there are certain capabilities that we really need to have in place. um, uh, And we need to have them in place for the fall and winter as we confront both COVID and uh, flu. That's data and data analytics, modernization of our data system. We're using a data system that's decades old, and we don't have an integrated public health data system for this nation, and we need to get that corrected. Uh, Laboratory resilience. We need to have multiple laboratory platforms in the public health lab, so there's really remarkable redundancy and surge capacity. We need a public health workforce, and the public health workforce that we're going to need to do the contact tracing and vaccine distribution Uh, both for uh, influenza and for the coronavirus vaccine when it's uh, uh, completed is substantial. And of course, we need to have uh, a concentration we'll come back to later on our global health security to make sure that we have the capacity around the globe to uh, detect, prevent, and respond to new pathogens uh, at their source. You know, Uh, as we look... I'm sorry, I don't mean to interrupt, but I have interviewed uh, people like former Senate Majority Leader Bill Frist, Senator Chris Coons, and others who have said that there have been many people, and I think including yourself, that were worried that a global pandemic was coming this way. So when you talk about this public health infrastructure, I, I guess my, my honest question is, why is it in, in such antiquated condition? You know, I think a lot of people have discussed it. You know, I mean, you know, I think I saw some clips the other night about President Obama in 2014. I've seen it go way back. Uh, but unfortunately, no one's really gone beyond to do the action required to rebuild our public health infrastructure to where it needs to be. I'm um, of the point of view, now is the time. Uh, if the experience that we just went through so far with the coronavirus can't awaken all of us, mm. that we can't afford not to be overprepared and overinvest. I kind of say it's time for our nation to have the public health infrastructure capacity, not only that our nation needs, but that our nation deserves. And it's going to take a sizable investment, but I'm going to say the lack of that public health infrastructure, very rapidly this outbreak when it started, as that outbreak started in the nursing home in Seattle, Uh, one of the best public health departments in this country, King County in the state of Washington, they rapidly were overwhelmed so they could no longer stay in what we call containment mode, early diagnose, Mm. contact tracing, isolation and quarantine. And I even uh, deployed about 40 people there to help them in those early weeks. And the bottom line is the public health system was overwhelmed. And they went then to full mitigation. And that full mitigation led to the uh, economic shutdown that we've seen. We can't go back there. We need to get the public health infrastructure in this nation that we can operationalize containment. That's early diagnosis, and that means rapidly, readily available testing wherever we need it and getting timely results. We need to have contact tracing, and that means those contacts have to be all identified and traced and evaluated and tested 
within a day or so. They need to have capacity to isolate people. And, you know, there are a number of people that are going to need isolation that don't have homes or they live in multi-generational houses. That has to be developed. And then, uh, again, uh, this is part of the critical component so we can do this. And then you put on top of it what I said, why I said this fall and winter is going to be difficult. I didn't say it was going to be worse. Mm. I didn't say it was going to be more deadly. As some quoted, I said it's going to be more difficult mm. because we're going to be getting the second experience with coronavirus as it expands in the fall and winter. At the same time, we're getting influenza. This time, we were lucky in one sense that the coronavirus became active after the second wave uh, of influenza A basically went back to baseline. Uh, but this fall, it's going to be it's going to be coronavirus and flu. And then when you ask me what else can we do? What we can do is get the American public to a point that they'll embrace flu vaccine with confidence. Right now, less than mm. 50% of the American public take advantage of the flu vaccine. And many people don't realize, you know, sadly, we're at uh, over 90,000 deaths from coronavirus so far this year. But over the last decade, we lost 360,000 people who died in this country from flu. And we have a vaccine that more than half of the people in this country decide not to take. So we're gonna be working hard to get people to accept flu vaccine with confidence. We're gonna be working hard to expand t testing capabilities all across this country. Congress just appropriated another $11 billion to help states, local, territorial, and tribal health departments uh, to get that up to speed, and we're working with them. We're gonna expand the contact tracing uh, public health workforce. And when I say expand, I'm talking about increasing it by 30 to 100,000 people. So contact, I mean, I just wanna clarify. So you're gonna increase contact tracing by, by 30 to 100,000 people. Yeah, and, it, the ultimate number was gonna be decided by the states and their right. plans, but my estimate, you know, Tom Friedman mm. had estimated it might be as high as 300,000. Our current working estimates are between 30,000 and 100,000. Uh, ultimately, that number is gonna be decided by uh, um, the, the efforts that we have with the local health departments, but that's ongoing now, and it needs to be mm. in place, operationally ready uh, by October, uh, of this year. And, and I think it's really important. The other thing we can talk about a little later is the other side of this that's critical is to reestablish uh, our global health security capacity around the world. But right, this but is what needs to happen. Before we get there, um, just listening to you, and I'm you know, tensing up uh, with, with you know, very, very serious um, uh, depiction that you're sharing, and we have a lot of the country reopening. And I guess my, my very blunt question to you is, are we ready to reopen right now? Are we, because we don't have those 30 to 100,000 people in place. We don't have the testing and the contact tracing and the public health infrastructure to the point where you think it should be. Is the nation ready to go through this you know, reopening uh, phase right now? Steve, I, I think it is. And I'm obviously part of it. CDC is putting out guidance. We put out a lot over the weekend again about, you know, how to re reopen uh, safely. Uh, I want to clarify that the community-based trans, community-community transmission mm. that overwhelmed the public health departments in late February, March, April, um, that's really coming down. Right now, what CDC and the state public health systems are doing is we're fighting outbreaks. We have nursing home outbreaks and we're going in and, and containing them. We're having meatpacking plants containing them, prison containing them, um, homeless containing them, certain social events from a wedding or a funeral containing them. And we're gonna continue to do that over the summer. And, and, and as we do that, we're gonna be expanding what I just told you. But we have, we have the capability, and as part of the guidance that we gave, the president gave for the states to open up, it was in the importance that they could test people that have flu-like illness and or syndromic disease. They could set up surveillance. They had the contact tracers that they needed right now. But in the fall winter, we're going to need a much more robust workforce because we're going to start seeing, we have to make the mission that we're going to stay in containment. We can't mm. get to the point that we have to retreat from containment. I believe we're going to get there. The testing has to be readily available, and it's increasing. I think yesterday there was 400,000 tests done in a day. 
you know, a, where that exact number needs to be is being defined. But Congress really helped enormously, uh, where they released $11 billion for the states to begin to really concretize that testing and contact tracing and isolation. Uh, clearly, from the testing point of view, the states are required to have a plan that CDC and, and the uh, uh, Admiral Drawer and HHS mm. were all working together to help them with their plan, which will be due uh, at the end of uh, May for at least June and July, and then by the middle of June for the rest of the year. So there's going to be a robust plan. In that plan, it's also going to incur aggressive surveillance. One of the complexities about the coronavirus, unlike flu, is that a substantial amount of the human-to-human -human transmission is occurring from people who don't even have symptoms. Mm. So that makes it harder. How do I know who's infected if right. there's no symptoms? So we are establishing really a robust surveillance program, which is going to be very intensive on te testing. You heard it announced the other day that, uh, or actually today, I think it's going to be announced, uh, if it hasn't already, um, that we're expanding the nursing home testing so that every individual resident of a nursing home will be tested mm -hmm. so we can make sure. We're going to be developing similar surveillances in inner city clinics and homeless populations and in meatpacking uh, things and other parts of society to try to figure out what the best way is. But uh, I want to be confident and, and give confidence. I'm confident that if we make this investment, um, we, we're going to get the infrastructure in place and we have every intent of staying in containment. Right. The public health capacity of this country is great, but the challenge has been we haven't had a sustained investment in data, data modernization. We have some health departments that are still using pen and pencil, right? We've got to get an integrated data system for the whole nation and actually have that data system and its analytics be so effective that it actually can do predictive data analysis. So you can predict what's going to happen in the next day or two. So you're right. going to be on top of it. We need that laboratory resilience. Right. Uh, and, and with multiple platforms in these laboratories, we're going to have to make that investment and the workforce. Right. Now, I'm just going to say one last thing, and I'll go back to your question. Mm. It's going to cost money. But I think people have seen the price we paid by not having that public health infrastructure and that redundancy. This is one thing that we need to be overprepared, mm. not, not underprepared. And when you think that we're thinking now that this will maybe end up costing three to six trillion dollars for us to get through this. Uh, it's a small price right. to pay finally once and for all to stop talking about building the public health infrastructure this nation needs and more importantly deserves, but to get it done. Right. Now's the time. I want to move to the global scene, but before I do that, I want to just ask you about one thing. And you mentioned the CDC guidelines that had come out. Has, is there a gap between what the White House released and what the CDC internal guidelines were? Because there's been some reporting that, that, you're, that you wanted to have, um, I, I would say, more stringent, more clear, more direct guidelines, and would just love to get your sense of whether or not what came out was a triangulation, whether that compromise was something you're comfortable with, or whether politics pushed us there. Well, I'm going to say politics didn't push us there. Steve, first and foremost, it's a, uh, you know, when this outbreak started, it was a CDC pro, uh, task force within one of my centers. And then uh, on, on the 7th of January, and then on, um, it on, uh, became a, on the 17th, a, a opera, uh, operationalized emergency response center for all of CDC. So right. it became an all the CDC. And then at, in January 27th, it became HHS and right. the task force. And then it became the vice president. So this, yeah. this, uh, um, uh, outbreak has gone from a CDC to an all the government response. As a consequence, there are uh, guidances that we come up that have significant interagency uh, implications. And say they go up through an interagency uh, review, and the interagencies make different comments, and they come back to us, not as mandates, but as comments, and then we have to integrate them. Right. One of the things that became clear at the task force when we put up our initial uh, uh, guidelines is the number of people criticized, and I think appropriately, that a lot of our guidelines are written in what they called CDCEs, meaning that they're not easy for the American public to actually get through. And so the decision was, why don't you guys do some decision trees that are simple, one pages, you've probably seen it, mm. targeting the American public. And we released those six decision trees uh, last week. 
But behind those decision trees are the regular specific CDC documents that we have for the public health community. They went back through the interagency review, good comments, and they were also all released. In addition, all of our documents on reopening America again, related to surveillance, the surveillance in hospitals, um, our contact tracing guidance, testing, and these specific uh, business issues and opening your business, bars and restaurants, camps uh, and, and youth, schools, daycare centers, all of those now are out on our website. We have over a thousand, I think we have close to 1600 documents now that are out there. The American mm -hmm. public is looking at them. We've got over 1.6 billion hits on our guidance so far, and we have well over 100 separate guidance documents. So I'm very happy with them. The only reality is the process takes time. Right. Uh, and, and some, you know, I will say some people may not be historically used to that because in the past, and when we had the Ebola outbreak where right. we had a total of 11 cases, four of which actually occurred in the United States, that entire outbreak response was done by CDC mm. or Zika. This response is much more complex. You know, I've been, you know, we're working and, and responding with coordination across the government that includes the Homeland Security, the State Department, Transportation, Custom and Border Control, Treasury, right. uh, Education, Labor, Agriculture. I mean, it's a, it's a big all of a gun response. Sure. So while some people may uh, storyboard it that way, mm -hmm. I will tell you that it's been a productive process. Well, let me ask you about the global public health scene. And you have a global uh, set of assets in CDC. You work with other organizations like the WHO. Sometimes I feel like people are looking at the fact that America, that this is just an American issue. But um, you know, and I think I know, that, that if you've got nations out there that don't have an infrastructure, that don't have some of what's going on, that if this brews somewhere else, as it did in Wuhan, China, this could come back. And so I'm interested in your own take on the strengths or weaknesses of our own global public health network right now. Yeah, I think it's a really important, and truthfully, Steve, I think it is the most critical. Um, this nation is going to need a health security capacity as long as we're a nation. And if this didn't remind people, and I'm in the process of restructuring, it's actually one of my top, top priorities. As you know, I spent 23 years in the armed forces. I think I've uh, I got a good handle on this. To put in place the global health security structure that this nation needs for 2030, 2050, and beyond. And we're in the process of trying to strategically decide hmm. um, where that is. Right now, I have uh, people in over 60 countries with offices in over 45 around the country. I'm trying to really consolidate it so I have full capacity kind of in a regional strategy, uh, maybe eight to 12 regional capacity. They're full CDC capacity strategically placed around the world. Think of it no different than what the Defense Department does when it sets up its bases. CDC is not a health development corporation. Mm. We, can, we can do health development. We help in it, like PEPFAR mm. and the malaria programs, but we have a health de development corporation. That's called USAID. I argue that CDC is a health security organization. Mm. It's a core responsibility and needs to be built as a core capability of CDC. We're the tip of the spear so that we can diagnose, prevent and respond to outbreaks at their source, as we are doing right now, according to the Ebola outbreak, for example, in the DRC, where, you know, I would have loved to have a much more a robust CDC enterprise uh, in Beijing than the smaller footprint that I have right now. We need to get sustained long-term funding. We need to get buy-in that this is a core function of CDC. CDC is not just a domestic organization. CDC is the tip of the spear for this nation's global health security. It needs to be recognized for that, and it needs to be funded for that. Uh, we're, we're ready to really roll out and operationalize a, a global health security footprint for this nation, mm. as I mentioned, for 2030, 2050, and beyond. And I think it's one of the most important things we can do. We, we've seen how one little pathogen 
can bring this nation to its knees. Just finally, Dr. Redfield, that was very powerful. I want to thank you. Um, there are billions of eyeballs right now on your reports, on the guidelines you're giving, on the institution. And, you know, there are some pot shots right now. There are folks, folks that are there saying, you know, the CDC uh, is not performing as it should. Peter Navarro was very uh, 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 blunt about some of his criticism as, you know, allegedly Dr. Burks was and others. And this may be, you know, skirmishing stuff, but I'm interested in what, how, how you would respond about the institution. I should add that Richard Edelman and his trust barometer uh, has shown that there's more and more trust in the CDC uh, than, there's, than there's been, you know, in past, and government in general. So you have both of these going on at the same time. So I'd love to give you an opportunity um, to share your own insights into the CDC and institution and respond to some of those folks you work with who've been public with their criticisms. Yeah, I, first I would say uh, uh, CDC has never been stronger. You know, we have tens of thousands of some of the finest uh, dedicated individuals that are data-driven and grounded in science. And the thing that really, uh, uh, I didn't realize how much I missed it after I left the military and went into academia, these men and women are service individuals. They're committed to public service. And the CDC has uh, jumped out on this outbreak from the beginning. The first notification from CDC of the unspecified pneumonias that occurred in Wuhan, uh, I had on December 20, uh, 31st. All right. The first uh, sit rep we did for this was on uh, January 1st. We mm. notified the National Security Council on G January 2nd. We activated our emergency um, uh, incident commander system within the Center for Immunization and, and uh, in, in back in respiratory disease and immunization back in January 7th. I activated all of CDC. I've only done it. I've only done it two other times since I've been CDC director, one for Ebola and one for Ovali, we activated our entire agency for an emergency response on January 17th. And again, obviously, uh, the secretary called a public health emergency in, I think, January 27th. And so an enormously aggressive response. Hmm. Uh, they're, they're, um, you know, Dr. Brooks and I, we go back a long way. We worked together in the, in the military for over a decade. We have very strong... She was uh, articulating what I'm articulating. There was no, you know, despite the press, there was no space between us. Mm. She was articulating that the data system that we currently rely on is archaic. Mm. Well, I've, I've been arguing that before Congress for two years. That's why Congress step, stepped up to give us originally $50 million for the data modernization. We need to have modernized the data system. And we need to have one public health data system for the whole nation. Mm. Not every single state having. So we are actually saying the same thing. The, 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 the conversation that was going back and forth was we're in the process of getting that operationalized over the next 12 months or so. And Dr. Burks was making an argument, which I totally agree with. It would benefit this nation for us to get it done sooner. Mm. Mm. Uh, and so a lot of that, and Peter Navarro, I don't know where his comments from. They were highly inaccurate. Unfortunately, uh, the CDC developed a test for this virus within 10 days of the sequence being published. I don't think anyone's ever developed one that quick in the history of mankind. And we actually were able to use that test to diagnose the original cases January 21st. And, and those are in cases before the EUA was approved in, in I think, January 24th. Uh, and that test is perfect. It's not faulty. It's not flawed. It works perfectly. It's a great test. Many people have uh, developed their test uh, after it since we've published exactly how to do it. Where the complication, and that test was available at CDC then, it's available today. It's never been not available. The only complexity was you had to send the sample to CDC in Atlanta. We, our team tried to then manufacture and scale up so that we could get that test in all the public health labs in the right. country. And in that pro process, one of the reagents uh, got contaminated and didn't perform reliably. Nobody was told right. they were positive or negative incorrectly, but it just didn't work. But we figured out what it was really within days and then worked with the FDA to modify our EUA. Right. And it took about three weeks. And then we had that testing in every public health lab, uh, 900, right. 100, I think we have, uh, 
testing through uh, in 95 uh, public health labs across the country. And what I want to emphasize, because mm. this gets lost, is there wasn't a moment in this nation's history with COVID that we didn't have the availability of the public health testing at CDC. We, in February, when that glitch came, we doubled our laboratory capacity. We opened a whole new lab. So there was never a time when the state couldn't send us a sample. Mm. We're glad it got fixed. If I had, you know, my dream, I wish we never had a glitch, Right. you know, but I will tell you that rather than being criticized, and I go back to something I read every day now from Teddy Roosevelt, you know, uh, you know, never mind the critic, and I paraphrase, you know, the credit goes to the man or woman that are in the arena, all bloodied and scarred and marred, um, but at least we're out there. Uh, and fail, you know, failing and going better, failing and going better. And at the end of the day, uh, we either know the triumph of high achievement or we end up falling short and failing, but at least we failed while daring greatly. Uh, we're in there all the way. I think the CDC has never been stronger. As uh, the, the, the difference, uh, and if you ask the the health departments across the country, I have over 600, almost 650 people now embedded in their health departments from right. CDC. To them. I have over, right now, over 40 rapid response teams helping them respond to outbreaks in meatpacking plants, nursing mm -hmm. homes, uh, prisons. And actually today I'm deploying right. nine more teams. Right. So we're, uh, we're strong. I, you know, some people get, they're not as tough skinned as I am. You know, negative criticism hurts their uh, hurts their um, morale, mm. and I try to counter it. I'd love to get some great stories to help their morale because they're great men and women. And lastly, I'll say what you said when you said it. When you look at the polling, the American people trust CDC, mm. right? When you look at our guidelines that are out on the on the our websites, we've already had a 1.6 billion hits on them. eyeballs. Yep. Eyeballs. So <laughs> people may say we're sidelined. We've never had 1.6 billion hits on anything right. we've And the last thing I'll say, you know, I got a chair at the table representing CDC at every task force meeting, always have the opportunity to give the best public health advice of the agency. And that advice is always listened on, listened to and respected. And we continue to do that. So again, my view, sadly, it's a false narrative. And I wish the, uh, uh, I, I'm confident the American people will continue to have trust and confidence in CDC. Well, we will leave it there. Dr. Robert Redfield, the man in the arena, the institution in the arena, the CDC, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, and I wanna thank all of you for joining me today. We'll see you tomorrow. I'm Steve Clemens, be well.